Thanks for you guys joining us on the uh, live screen today, but we also appreciate everybody being here. Thank you. We're going to talk today about jealous God. Last week we talked about how he's a consuming fire, and we said we were going to mention his jealousy today, and I think you're going to find it pretty intriguing. So that's what we're going to talk about. Deuteronomy 4.24, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. God calls himself a jealous God, which some find offensive. I believe I heard that Oprah Winfrey, not to name drop or anything, but I believe she was, has always called herself a Christian. I don't know if she is or what, doesn't matter. But she said what really annoyed her about Christianity and made her question whether she was a Christian was the fact that she had heard a sermon once on the jealousy of God. And she couldn't understand how a God who has everything could be jealous of anything. And so it made her kind of question um, her belief in God. And here's the deal. When we should all have questions and doubts. I mean, it's very natural to go through tough times and go, what's going on? Why is this happening? That doesn't make any sense. Whatever it is, maybe an investigation of scripture, you start digging a little deep. Ooh, that's a little more complicated than I thought. Well, you know what? I wouldn't use that theology to say, okay, I don't believe. I'd keep investigating. There's answers. Maybe we don't understand things. Maybe the sermon she heard, uh, for whatever reason at that particular moment in time, threw her off a little bit. Is that good enough reason to put on the old empire hot and decide you're going to vote against God and you're going to throw a flag? It, come on, we got to dig a little deeper when we don't understand things. Um, there's always a biblical explanation, excuse me, explanation, and uh, we need to investigate a little bit further. We know that Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, this is very familiar to most all of you as Christians. We know our thoughts aren't his thoughts. And he says this, he actually said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Okay, that tells us a lot about him right there. He's not like we are. He allowed Jesus to be formed into the image of a man to have sympathy and understanding for what we travail and go through. But God himself, who is a spirit, is nothing like man. So his, his whole idea of creation is different than ours. His view of looking at people is different than ours. His ideas don't line up with the rest of us. If they did, we'd all be probably more of what we are and what we are needs to change. We need to quit being more of who we are and start being more of who God is and what God intends. So yes, his ways are different. Verse nine says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. All right, so point number one today, God is jealous for us. He's jealous for you. He's jealous for his children he wants to keep giving us the best of himself. He doesn't like us to satisfy for something that seems good, that seems to meet a few needs here and there, or maybe for a lifetime, but they're not as full as everything God can do and give us. He, uh, he does not want his glory stolen by some demon alternative or shared with some lame, false, powerless God. Like last week, we talked about God, lower case G. There are gods out there. There are other gods. And don't think you might not worship any of them. If you love to eat more than you love God, you probably put food before God. Anybody ever had that issue before? There's other things. There's alcoholism. There's other things that people will put before God that does meet a need or they wouldn't do it. One thing about the bottle, for example, is it's going to meet your need or you wouldn't do it. It works. And so many other things do the same thing. 
you go there because they're supplying something inside of you that's lacking. And they don't reject you, like pornography. It doesn't reject you. Um, drinking, perhaps certain drugs, they don't reject you. They're always inviting you. It's a safe haven. Or it wouldn't, it wouldn't do it if it didn't meet a need. But God's saying, is a jealous God, he's saying, hey, I can meet that need better than you can through that device. You got to let me. And wow, that's when Christianity for some of us deepens even more is how do you let him? How do you let go? How are you sure he can help me out more than such and such can? Well, he's jealous to do that. And he's not going to compromise until that becomes a reality in our lives. The Bible depicts jealousy as a sin. And we've all seen people do ter terrible things because of jealousy. James 4, 1 through 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you have not. So you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask God, you do not receive because you ask in the wrong motives. I know some of you go, oh, my motives are always good. Well, God had answered them if they were. A lot of times we pray for things and expect things and our motives are completely skewed. And we need to check out what's our problem and admit there's a weakness there and allow God to examine it and redefine it for our lives so that we can be more like Jesus. And I don't know if you guys know this or not, but we're not. And we need to be. Amen. Jesus is a tall order, but he's awesome. He's loving. He's kind. He's patient. He's generous. Always. And you know what? His light shines through us because he says, you can, guys can do it too. But you've got to let me consume you with my fire and burn out that which needs to die in you and give you my life. And you say, well, that sounds like such a threatening, intimidating, scary thing. The truth of the, hands, the, truth of the matter is we are in the hands of a loving God who we can trust, who we can rely on, who we can count on. He's not going to treat us badly if we end up in a quote unquote bad situation. Nine times out of ten, we put ourselves there. You reap what you sow, right? Or do you sow what you reap? Well, reap what you sow. Anyway, I wish I could blame that one on my accident too, but <laughs> some stuff I uh, just kind of go a little goofy. Uh, but I think that's right. You. What you put into something is what you get out of it. And how many times have we done something really dumb and put ourselves in a really dumb position and go, God, why? You know, kind of like the old joke. I know you've all heard it where the guy is sitting on top of a mountain and a flood is coming and it keeps getting taller and taller. And a guy comes by on a boat and he says, hey, man, you need a lift? Nope. I'm waiting on God to rescue me. Mountain gets a little shorter, closer to the water. The water's really coming up, and a helicopter comes over, drops a rope, says, You need help down? Nope. I'm waiting on God to save me. And then the guy ends up drowning. And he gets to heaven. He said, God, why didn't you save me? And God said, Well, I dropped a rope and I sent a boat by. You know, that's the deal. A lot of times we're the ones who screw it up. God's got his answers. We're not always looking for them. Okay, so verse four, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world? Well, let's go back to three. When you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. People get themselves stuck somewhere and they get out of what they're stuck in, thanks to God. And then they go back and get stuck right back in it again. You, adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world, compromising your standards, means that you're at odds with God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Don't go back. 
We were all enemies of God before we found God, or should I say God found us? Why do we keep going back to the old slavery days when God's asking us to live in the future and the present and live in freedom? Well, you know what? There's, we have to think about that. There's a reason we go back and sometimes it is we don't think God can meet the needs that we have. And it's not, oh, I got to have more faith and I got to punish myself more and I got to pull it together more. I, I, I. The problem is us. You need to get on your face and go, you know what? I can't do it without you, God. I, I don't even know where to start. I don't know where to begin. I humble myself before you, God. I need to maybe shut up. Maybe I need to quit trying so hard. Maybe I quit need, I don't know what to do, God, but oh, you're gonna have to tell me because I'm the problem and I'm trying to solve the problem. I've got this issue and I'm trying to serve, serve it or change it with all these ideas. And the truth is I need your ideas. I need your guidance. Just like I can't get myself to heaven without the grace and mercy and power of Jesus Christ, I cannot overcome this weakness unless you, O oh jealous God, become so jealous of me and I allow you to consume me in your repentant fire. That's the only change I can make. And I don't know where to start. I've gone to these church lessons and I try and blah, blah, blah. Oh God, I need you. Now we can trust God that when we die, we're going to go to heaven. But we don't trust God that while we're living and struggling through life, we can have heaven in us. And if we have heaven in us, there's certain things we no longer need. So why don't we have heaven in us? Nine times out of ten, we don't want it. We want what we want. And, and then we go, oh, that's right. I'm wrong. I need to change. And what you need to do is get on your knees and admit the truth and say, God, I'll never change without your help. I'll never change without your deliverance. I'll never change without your mercy. And I need to quit acting like I have when I have it. I need you. God, I need you. You know what it says in the Bible? It says, the more the word of God, what's, what's the guy pray? He says, I want to know your word, God. I want to know you so I won't sin against you. I know it's hard. Reading the Bible sometimes, especially if you don't understand it. I know it's challenging, but that's why you have friends and family and people that know the Lord maybe a little bit more than you that can explain things and help you. And we all need this. We need this nourishment. We need this food. God is a jealous God and he wants to fill you up with himself. And meet your needs. But maybe those needs are met. Because you spend a little time in the word. You spend the time coming to church. You hang out with people that are going to do good for you. Rather than kind of deflate you. And bring you down. You know what? Something God told me a while back. I might have even mentioned it when he did. Is I felt like I listened. It says in Timothy. Don't listen to godless chatter. And boy, that jumped at me one day because I thought I spend a lot of negative time listening to negative news, listening to just a bunch of Mickey Mouse garbage that just brings me down. Gets in my head. I start thinking about it like the whole political thing. Should we be involved and vote? No, of course. And we should be educated. But should we be consumed by that or consumed by the fire of God? I choose the fire of God. I'm tired of that stuff burning a hole in me. It's a waste. It's godless chatter. Oh, and that included movies and TVs and downtime. God needs to be my source and my energy, not other things. Now, I'm not saying I can just break away like that. It's a habit. And like a lot of habits, they die slow. But I'm aware of the fact that I listen to a lot of godless chatter and it's defeating. I need it out of my life. I need more of God's word in me. There's nothing wrong with that. People, oh, the word's boring. No, not if it's served by a God who's jealous and says, if you do this, if you receive this, I will change your life. I will fill up gaps that you have in your life to make you more full, more whole, more healthy. 
And maybe I need to quit talking and start listening more. You know what I mean? There's, there's ways to improve, but we think we've already figured out because we went to a conference one day or somebody spoke over us one day and now we're permanently in play. No, we're not. We're up against the wall of the enemy every single day. And if we don't approach it with the guidance of the power of God in our lives, we will get pecked off. We're not that good without Jesus. According to the Bible, God's jealousy is not based on insecurity. His jealousy erupts when his children are not living their best lives. He wants you to have an abundant life, a full life, a complete life, a life that is not bored, a life that does not need to rely on surface things to get you through it. He wants to fill you up and complete you and make you whole, not on a Sunday morning, but on a Thursday or a boring Wednesday or whatever God wants to be alive in your life. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be answered. Sometimes we go, well, I'm just kind of, uh, today. Are you seeking? Are you finding? Are you praising? Are you worshiping God anyway? Are you resolved to be merciful to people? If you're merciful when you're down and out in blue, and you give mercy away, you'll find mercy again. And mercy is going to make you happy. When you give of yourself more than you take, you will find Jesus. Because that's who Jesus is. He's a giver. He's merciful. He always errs on the side of grace and love and joy. What's your problem? I say that because I have to ask myself when I look in the mirror, what's my problem? Oh, my problem is me. And it's not that God wants to, to take me out and go, you're nothing, Doug. No, he said, I'm jealous of you. I want you to be everything you can be. I don't want you to stop short. I want to make you whole. I want to make you healthy. I want to make you everything God wants you to be. Everything I want you to be, Doug, I can do it. Don't stop. Don't pull back. Don't hesitate. Don't get tripped up. If you don't need, if, for example, I don't need to listen to godless chairs. Stop doing it. If I, example, need to quit doing something or whatever, I need to go, okay, God, I can't, but you can, and I need to just stop. So you can, but we convince ourselves we can't. And we want God to be jealous of us so that he can change us and help us become everything we're supposed to be. But to change us may be more than just stopping something because, well, that fix everything. No, no, no. He might be changing other things about us. We think he has to change us by making us stop doing things we shouldn't be doing. What if he wants to change us even more than that? He's jealous of us. He wants the best for us. We should be willing to try to give it to him. God's jealous and you can't belong to him and be dedicated to something else. Back to James 4, 5 and 6. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that his jealousy longs for the spirit? He has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. Let's read that again. He jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell within us. If you're a believer, he's given you his spirit. He longs to make that spirit in you complete and whole. If you're going to argue and all that and be mad because you don't have everything you want to have, you're not allowing the jealousy of God to take over for who he really is. And he won't, you, you, you stunt your own growth. James 4, 1 through 6, all those verses, we see that human jealousy and its destructive effects. You covet, you kill, you quarrel and fight. Human jealousy damages life, ultimately longing for what we want and only wanting it for ourselves. That's why we're even a little jealous. Jealousy becomes a scary vice, lighting other dangerous vices in our lives. 
Proverbs 27, 4 says, anger is cruel and fury overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? On the other hand, God's divine jealousy longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. God's jealousy longs for a relationship. Father to child, he offers abundant peace and contentment, freedom over sin and self, victory to conquer and overcome. Man, you say, well, I don't know how to do it. Maybe you just got to get on your face and plead with the almighty God to show you who you really are and to allow his jealousy to consume you like fire and help you become everything you can be. And you might think, well, all I have to do is fix this. or fix You don't know, so just stop. Just give it all up. Give it all up. Quit trying to reason it and figure it out. Well, I'm not that bad. You're not, but that doesn't matter. What matters is God is holy and good and wonderful and awesome. And you can always give him more, more, more. By that, I mean surrender, release, give. Point number two, God is never jealous because of need. God's not jealous like we are. We need stuff. We want stuff. God's not that way. God's never jealous because of need, greed, or being covetous, which is an unhealthy craving and a wrong for desire for someone or someone's possessions. He's not jealous because he's lazy and unwilling to put forth the effort to accomplish his purposes. God's not jealous due to pettiness like we often are, disliking certain individuals, begrud begrudging achievements. He's not frustrated with his position in the world. Think about it. He's God. He's pretty cool. He's got it pretty secure. He knows what he's doing. It's us. God's jealousy reacts to evil. And it reacts to evil the right way. We react to evil, but a lot of times we're emotional and passionate. And we get, oh boy, frustrated. God knows how to do it the correct way. His jealousy is praiseworthy. Preserving something he finds supremely precious and delightful. You. Me. You say, well, God, isn't God jealous for all of us? Yeah, he is, but he's jealous for you as an individual. You're as precious to him as one person, as all of us are as a group of his children. Don't you love your children? It's hard to go, oh, I love that one more. Well, that one's better. No, no, no. They're all, the, it doesn't matter. You can't love them separately. You know, the old question of children well who do you love better I none of you all of you the same I love each one of you the same I can't separate nobody can and when parents say things like well I can't wait for my kids to go back to school and leave me alone I've always been what don't you want to be with them I may be weird Lisa and I may be weird about that but we always want them to go everywhere all the time, no matter what we did, we just took them with us. Bunches of them at the same time. Their friends can come too. We love them. And it, when one of them comes to us and they have a need, we just gave them all we had because that's the one right that moment that needed more or something. We gave it our best shot. So... How and why does God pick us? Why does he love us so much? He's jealous of his deity. God is a God and cannot endure anything in our lives wearing his crown. That's his crown. He gave you his inheritance. He gave you your salvation, our salvation, because he loves us. He doesn't want to share that crown with anybody. He's jealous of his sovereignty. He made heaven and earth and rules his creation. He does it and he wills. Just like we said earlier, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. It's God's ways. And it's not like it's his way and the highway and he's going to step on. You know, his ways are all good. We just have a hard time believing that's possible sometimes because we've had it so rough. 
We think, God, man, I don't deserve God to love me. Doesn't matter. He loves you anyway. He'll pick you up. He'll help you no matter what, whether you deserve it or don't deserve it. Doesn't matter. God just good. He runs everything. It's his creation. He can do what he wants. That means he can love us if he wants to, and he does. He's jealous, number three, of his glory. God's glory is rooted in his character, expressed in his actions. Every action he takes has something to do with the glory of God. Number four, he's for recognizing, he's for us recognizing his love for us. And that's a big problem because a lot of people have a hard time believing they are loved by God. But he's jealous for that fact. Can you believe I can love you despite your rotten self? Can you use peace? I'm here to help you. I will provide for you. I will protect you. I will help you. I will cover you. I will be there for you. You're never alone. Can you believe it? Love is God. I don't believe it. Well, that's the problem. He can do it anyway. Number five, he's jealous of everything which steals our affections for him. If you've got something more important than God in your life, he's jealous of it. He wants to be in charge of everything and he should be. Varied enemies trouble us physically, pester us mentally, antagonize us emotionally, and perhaps even relationally, financially, grievously. But with Jesus on our side, God's jealousy guards our hearts, minds, and spirits. Therefore, the multiple foes and stresses of life will never uproot our hearts. It's the devil bringing you down. It's the flesh that brings you down. It's the world's lies that deceives us. God has no intention of doing anything but taking care of us like we're his children. Best intentions at heart. Romans 8, 31 through 39. Just listen to this. You've heard it before. Just listen. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? You got God on your side. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that. Who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Get a load of that. People say, well, what happened to Jesus after he died? He was ascended. He sits at the right hand of God, which is huge. And on top of that, he's praying for us. I would rather have God praying for me than anybody else. Because God answers Jesus' prayers. It's when we try to do it ourselves and think we have to have faith. You don't have to have faith. You just need to count on Jesus. Your job, Jesus. Your will, Jesus. You're sovereign. You're perfect. You're whole. I trust you. I trust you. And then you say, well, if I just trust Jesus, what am I going to be? I'm going to be one of those giddy idiots. <laughs> Welcome to the party. You need to stop trying to figure out and start letting Jesus live through your life. You're not going to be a waste of time. You're not going to be bored and you're not going to be pointless. You're going to have a purpose, a value, a reason. And it's going to be more than you ever dreamed possible. And you might actually enjoy yourself. It's, it's wonderful to see God at work in our lives. It's a wonderful thing. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship? Persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, swords? As it is written, for your sake you face death all day long, and we are considered as sheep for the slaughter. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors. The world may make you think you're no good. Your flesh may convince you you're no good. The devil, he's, that's what he does. He accuses, he ridicules, he picks, picks, picks. 
For I am convinced that, need, no, wait, no, in all these things, we, verse 37, we, you and me, are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Wait a minute. We don't just get to conquer. We're, all of a sudden, we become more than conquerors. That drink, that pornography, whoa, 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 whoa. what? No, no, no. You, you don't just conquer. You conquer it more. You're more than a conqueror. It gets behind you and you win and you're victorious and you're full of hope and power and energy because Christ lives in you. And it's only the devil that makes you want to believe that is not true or your flesh going, I'll never pull it off. I'll never do it. Or the world going, you don't even want to try. You want to be like us. You don't want to be like the world. You don't want to count on you. You want to trust Jesus. And he says, I'll make you more than a conqueror. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels or demons, neither the present nor the future or nor any powers, neither height or depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God as in Christ Jesus. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen. That's good news. That's what the gospel is. That's why Jesus is so great. He changes you from within and you become more than you ever thought possible. He wants to teach you. He wants to show you. He wants to embrace you. You're a child. You're his child. And he wants you to be everything you can be. He's jealous of you. You know, for example, uh, when a woman... Has heard, we've heard these stories of a car rolls over and the kids pinned underneath the car and the mother lifts it up. She's so jealous, passionate, involved in that kid. She's going to lift it off the ground. Super strength, adrenaline, whatever. She's going to save that kid's life. Same thing with a guy. I heard the story of a guy who was sitting on a log with his son. And all of a sudden, he knocks the log off and the kid hits the ground hard. What happened, Daddy? Why'd you do that? Because there was a snake that was about to bite you and I wanted to grab it before it got a hold of you and threw it off. Love can hurt. Sometimes things unexpected happen, but it's Jesus protecting us. One time, uh, Caroline, when she was a little bitty, just walked right into a swimming pool. And Rachel... Because we had our backs turned and Rachel, man, she charged in there and jumped in that water and pulled that baby up. Well, we'd have done the same thing. Not only that, let's say there'd been some slow moving elderly woman walking along. We'd have knocked her over. We'd have knocked her out of the way to get that baby out of that water. You know why? Love. And people say, well, the Old Testament seems a little challenging and difficult. That's because Jesus was coming and nothing was going to stand in the way. Nothing. And if he had to push a few people over and get other people out of the way and kill a few idols and gods, that's what he did. Because nothing was going to stop Jesus Christ from showing up. And then they tried to kill him. Little baby. They tried to kill everybody four years old and under. Remember that? Didn't happen. Jesus, God had him move over to Egypt. And then as he was living, they, oh, they didn't like him. So they planned on crucifying him. And they did it. But he didn't stay dead. He rose up three days later. You know why? Because that's the plan of Almighty God. And it's not just the love of Jesus that did it. It's love for you and you and you and me. He just loves us. And he's going to do what he said he's going to do. And once he starts, there's no finishing it. I'm excuse me, there's no stopping it. He will complete what he's done. And we're, we're, what are we? Are we like, boy, look at us. We're Christian. Aren't we special? No, we're broken. We're humbled. We don't deserve it. But we thank God for being so good and loving. It doesn't thank you, God. So all we can say is thank you, God. John 20, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one, no one, this is Jesus talking, no one will snatch them out of my hand. You belong to Jesus, you're in. 
my father do what? Okay, John 10, 27 uh, through 29. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. And then he goes on to say, my father and I are one. Boo, who's going to pull us out of the hand of God, let alone Jesus? I don't know. I'm pretty much stuck on Jesus. I pretty much go, okay. That's what you say. Why should I doubt it? And it's not that you just don't perish. You die and go to heaven. No, heaven's in you right now. He can't snatch it away from you right now. Drugs and alcohol and all that junk. It's trying to take something away from you that God's jealous. Nope, nope, nope. This is what, if you want it, I'll give this to you. You know what we do? We don't want it. We want what we want because we're convinced that's what satisfies our needs. Lies. The devil's a liar. God can do it. We just got to be tough enough to hang in there and try and let him do what he does. Last point, and it'll be quick. How do we respond to his jealousy? 1 Peter 2.29, but you are a chosen people. You believe that? You're chosen by God. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Wow, you're special. You're a special possession of God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the wonderful light. You're called out of darkness. You were in darkness. I was in darkness. We've been in dark. A lot of people are still in darkness. But you know what God did? He brought us into the light. He brought us into the light. God is creator. He is love. He is wisdom. All that is, is his. And he invites us, you, to partner in his glory, to experience him fully, each in our own unique way. Like, for example, if you closed your eyes and I said, think of a barn. We all close our eyes. We're all going to think of a barn. It's all going to be a different barn. Your barn's going to be different than my barn. It's the way it is. But you're going to experience a barn if you think about it. Well, that's Jesus. You've got Jesus. You understand him as you understand him. He understands you as he allows himself to understand you or allows you to understand him. May not be the same as me. What we have in common is the barn. What we have in common is Jesus. He may look a little different to you. It doesn't matter. We're on the same page. He's our brother. God's our father. We're a part of the family of Jesus Christ. And God's jealous that we remain that way. Not to be mean or selfish or greedy. But because he knows what's best for us. And he never stops knowing what's best for us. It's shocking, his jealousy. Because it shows how serious he is in maintaining a relationship with us. It's serious business. How should we react to his jealousy? Three things. One, turn away from that which provokes his jealousy. It's wrong to claim that we love God when we don't really love him. Matthew 27 I'm excuse me, 22, 37 through 38. Jesus replied, love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Well, there's one right there. A lot of people, well, I love God. I love God. I love God. But they don't really love him because they do other things instead of loving him. They love something else. Don't get mad at yourself. Just admit it. God, I, I don't really love you. But I want to, but I don't even know how to. How do I love you? Really? Really love you? How do I do that? I want to. You're going to have to help me, God. You're going to have to help me. Number two, worship God as Jesus instructs in, four, in John 4, 24. God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. You're not going to get along with God if you try to please him by being a person who pleases people. You can only get along with God by doing what he tells you to do in your spirit. You got to hear him in your spirit. He's part of your spirit. Um, and truth, of course, is his truth. 
He knows what he's doing. His way's the right way. We got to follow his way. Number three, be committed to his cause. Acts 20, 24 is an example. I consider my life worth nothing. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's it. You raise your kids the best you can to the glory of God. You raise yourself the best you can according to the glory of God. You work on a farm. You work on a ranch. You, should, you clean commodes. Whatever you do, you're doing it to the glory of God. Your purpose is to say, God, thank you. Thank you, God. You're a great God. I worship you, God. I believe in you. I trust you. I need to do it more, God. But no matter what I'm doing, I'm going to do it for you, God. And if you have a greater purpose for me or a different purpose for me or whatever you want to do, please do it. Almighty God, let me just let you do it. I need to let go of the driving wheel. I'm going to control everything. I'm going to control everything. And you know what? I need to just let you have it. And I said, well, what do I do in the meantime? I might as well enjoy life. I might as well be merciful to people. I might as well direct my attention and my prayers to the benefit of God's glory. Instead of thinking about me, me, mine, mine, my way, my way, my way, my way. Now, you know what? I just need to let you do it, God. You'll tell me what to do. I trust you. You'll bring the right people around me. You'll show me what to do because I need you to show me. I don't know. I wish I were more of a man. I must be a little despicable, petty man since I don't know what I'm doing. I don't. I might as well just admit it. And when you give me the gumption to lead or to step forth or to do whatever, I pray to do it humbly, God. I don't need the attention. You need it. You deserve it. And I just want to be a part of it. And thank you. Thank you for letting me a part of it. Okay, conclusions. God's jealousy stands in opposition to anything attempting to shriek his glory or exchange his glory. Or devour his glory. Because he knows his glory is the best his children can receive from him. You can't go wrong ever walking and enjoying the glory of Almighty God. When Jesus says, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which is the Lord's prayer. He's saying let your glory be in my life during this situation, just like you plan it in heaven. You know what? That's a really good thing. It eliminates fear. It eliminates doubt. It eliminates worry. It gives you courage. It gives you a sense of commitment. It gives you contentment. It gives you peace of mind. It's a good thing. Don't go too far, Lisa, since I'm just about done. Okay, thanks, Cheryl. Get ready to shut her down. Is it your mom? Yep. Okay. All right, well, we'll pray for her too. All right, well, I'm ready to close, but my challenge to you guys is this. Let go, I mean, it, trivially, like, oh, sure, just let go and let Jesus. No, no. I mean, I know there's deep things going on in our lives. And God's jealous to take it all. For his glory. For your benefit. Maybe it takes a little surrender. Maybe it takes some humility. Maybe it takes some confession. Maybe it takes some real honesty. It's worth everything. It's worth it. It's worth it. You say, well, I'm not so sure it's worth Okay, don't do it then. But if you're willing to go, you know what, God? I'm, I'll try. I mean, I'll let go. Do it. Do it. Give him a chance. Anyway, we'll uh, pray together, but I just want to ask, is there anybody that just says, Doug, I, I need some work in this area of my life. I need to recognize how God jealous is for me, whether I don't believe he should be. I still know, he, and I know he wants the best for me. Would you just pray that I can just take the best? Is there anybody that wants it? I'm going to pray for you right now as a group. I'm not going to do it individually, but if you know you need to raise your hand and go, it's me. Please raise your hand. I will pray for you. Anybody else? Anybody? All right. Well, dear God, I pray that you, as the jealous God you are, 
would just overtake our weaknesses and help us recognize our flaws and our need for you. You are a great God. You are the wonderful God. You are the living God. And we need your help. We need you to be a part of our lives, our hearts, our minds, everything. God, we stretch our arms to you for you to stretch your arms and hug us. We just want to be enveloped in you, hugged by you, loved by you. We know we need to make changes. And God, only you can do it. And we're asking you to do it through us. We need deliverance. We need wisdom. We need more of your word. We need more strength. And we're asking you to provide it. And we ask all this in the great, precious, wonderful, perfect, and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.